as we are recording this, it is just after our Christmas break of 2021. Years are still baffling me. Over the Christmas break, I decided to catch up with some movies, some Christmas movies. So uh, watch Die Hard, because I've never seen that before. Uh, watch Die Hard 2, 3, 4 and 5, because you know once you've started, you might as well finish. So that was fun. Uh, got into the Taken franchise as well. Yes, Liam, you do have a unique set of skills, very impressive. Fear they're not very transferable, but that's okay. It seems to be working for you. Uh, but then, I decided it was time to watch Spartacus. I don't know if you've seen the film Spartacus, but it's about a slave in the Roman Empire who ends up being trained to be a gladiator. And there's a slight fracas at the gladiator school one day and he and his gladiator trainee friends escape. And they roam around Italy, setting slaves free and building a big slave army. And all they want to do is get home. So they start to move towards the south and they pay some pirates that are going to put them on some ships and sail them home. But unfortunately, the pirates sell them out. The borders are closed. No travel is allowed. And Spartacus and his army have three sections of the Roman army bearing down on them. They are defeated. And as what's left of Spartacus and his army are sat dejected in the hot sun, the Roman commander comes up and says, I will spare you death if you tell me who is the one called Spartacus. It's a moment's pause. And then Spartacus does the right thing. He stands up and he says, I am Spartacus. But then the man next to him stands up and says, I am Spartacus. And then some old lady over there stands up and goes, no, I am Spartacus. And before you know it, everybody is standing up and shouting, I am Spartacus. And then Rome executes them all. And you're sort of left wondering, well, what was the point of that? But anyway, it's a great film. So that was my Christmas break. I hope if you've had a Christmas break recently, you enjoyed it and watched some good films too. We are in a two-week series as we begin our jubilee year called The Manifesto. And, and last week, uh, Johnny was thinking about who Jesus is and what he's come to do and what that means for us. And we're going to carry on this week. You know, Jesus in Luke 4, he, he stands up in the synagogue in Nazareth and it's, he reads from Isaiah and he reads this. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. The year of the Lord's favour. It's interesting because in the Isaiah text, which we'll read in a moment, Isaiah goes on to say, and the day of vengeance of our God. Uh, Jesus is a little bit provocative in this chapter uh, because, because everybody sitting there would have been waiting for the day of vengeance. Uh, the day somebody comes along and sets them free from Rome. The day somebody comes along and, and helps them not live hand to mouth uh, day after day, week after week, but actually brings them financial prosperity and security. They were waiting for their day in, in the sun when God would destroy all their enemies. But Jesus comes and says, actually, I've come to declare a year of favour. And then as you read on, initially they're quite pleased with Jesus, but then he starts to point out how in the Old Testament, God didn't just bless the Jews. Actually, there were moments where he blessed their enemies instead, and that doesn't go down so well. But we at Renewal are in our 50th year, our Jubilee year, a year of favour and blessing. And it's interesting because when Jesus is talking in his little huddle in the synagogue in Nazareth, he's saying, hey, guys, the blessing that God wants to bring is for those out there. How do we take in our year of jubilee, the blessing that God has given us, and take it and proclaim it amongst those who don't yet know him? 
So that's what we're going to be thinking about today. Let's, let's look at Isaiah's original prophecy that Jesus is quoting from. So you'll recognize the first bit. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins. They shall raise up the former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities, the devastations of many generations. If we think about Isaiah's context, in a time when the people of God have really abandoned the worship of God and so their enemies have come in and are starting to cart them off to the surrounding nations where their cities are not too far away now from being burnt down, where they will be enslaved and oppressed and be mourning. And Isaiah says, somebody is going to come who's going to set you free. And where you've been grieving, he's going to bring joy where you've been heavy and in despair, actually, you're going to praise God again. Where you've been captives, you're going to be set free. It's a moment of hope as things are getting darker around them. But then Isaiah goes on. He says, they will be oaks of righteousness. They will rebuild the ancient ruins. In one version, it says, they will be the restorer of streets to dwell in. They will be the planting of the Lord. They will renew cities. And as you read that, you think, who, who, who are the they? Who, who are the they that Isaiah is talking about? Often uh, biblical commentators and preachers will say that the first bit of Isaiah 61 is Jesus' mandate. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me. He was saying it was upon him. But, but then the bits that he stops are the bits that he hands to the church to do. And I think there's something interesting in there. But before we dig into who are the they, I want to jump into a couple of other stories. One from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament. Who are they? These towering oaks that seem to be able to restore everything. Who, who are they? Well, let's jump to 1 Samuel 22. This was when Spartacus, uh, no, sorry, David was on the run. You see, King Saul had abandoned God and he knew that God had put his hand on David and he didn't like it. And he was hunting for David to find out where is this David because I want to destroy him to protect my power. And in 1 Samuel 22, it tells us this. David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Abdullam. And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. And everyone who was in distress, and everyone who was in debt, and everyone who was bitter in soul gathered to him. And he became captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men. Now, don't know if you've ever been on the run for your life, whether you've ever been hiding in a cave because literally the king is looking for you to try and harm you. But I'm sure you've had those moments of despair. I'm sure you've had what some of ancient Christians would call the dark night of the soul, where you're like, can this get any worse? And where is God? And you're crying out to God, God, send me somebody to help. And he sends you everybody else who is in debt, so they've got no money to help you, who is in distress, so they can't comfort your tears because they've got their own, and they're in despair or depressed, as another version says. I mean, just imagine that. At your lowest moment, everybody else in the nation who's low comes to you. I mean, misery likes company. But there's something interesting that happens. 
Because as you read on, you never hear about David and all those broken people that were with him. David and all those people in debt. David and all of those people in despair. You don't hear of that again. But you start to hear of things like David and his mighty men. David and the army that were with him. In, in his distress, David gets in a cave and everybody else in distress in the nation gathers to him. But something happens in that cave because those who are broken, those who are down on their luck, those who have nothing to offer suddenly become David's mighty men suddenly become the guys who will get behind the next king of Israel. There's a moment of transformation that happens. Let's jump to the New Testament now because there's a, a church that is interesting to look at. It's uh, the church in Corinth. Now, Corinth was a major trading city, and so lots of different cultures and nations and traders, people all around the world would have been meeting in Corinth. It was a real melting pot, and it was a real melting pot of morality. I mean, what went on in Corinth was known throughout the whole world. It was so wild that within the church, somebody was in an intimate relationship with their stepmom and nobody batted an eyelid. They just thought, oh, this is normal, right? This is fine, let's just let it go. And Paul has to write to them to go, um, sort it out. But then Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 6. He says, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither the, sexual, the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor the drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you. But you were washed, and you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. It, it's quite a provocative list there isn't it but Paul is calling out but you know before we get too judgmental and seeing you know amazing grace how sweet the sound that can fix a wretch like you Paul kind of holds the church to account and he goes guys and girls this was you B before you judge anybody else around you this was where you were and God came to you and he changed you and transformed you you were like this. You were like those broken people in the cave of Adullam that had nothing to offer. You were like these wild people in Corinth who were just out there, anything goes, having a fun time, living for themselves. But God came and he has transformed you into the people of God. So with those two stories in mind, let's go back to Isaiah. Who... Who are they? The year of God's favour. Who will be these people who are strong like oaks that can't be moved, that can rebuild and restore the world around them? If you want to do something great for God, you might not be they. But if you know you need God to do something great in you, then you are they. Who are the they? They're the poor that Jesus has come to bring the good news to. They're those who are bound and prisoners, be that literal prisoners or captives to sin, captives to addictions, captives to circumstance, can't get themselves out of the mess they find themselves in. They're those who are mourning and grieving and feel like life has just crushed them. And Jesus comes and he says, I'm going to transform you. The weakest broken amongst you will become an oak of righteousness. Not because of your strength, but because the Spirit of God was on Jesus to transform us. And we become they. When we allow him 
to do a deep work in us. When we come to him, not to impress him with our strength, but we come in our weakness, then we find that his strength is made perfect in us. So as we think about a year of blessing, as we think about the at least 50 missions that we want to launch as a church this year, at least 50 groups that we want to see, at least 50 new people joining teams, we have to realise that that happens, not because we've got something to offer, but because God comes and does something deep within us. And then as we go out into the world to proclaim the good news of Jesus, to carry out his manifesto, we go going, do you know what? I'm broken too. Do you know what? I was caught in sin too. Do you know what? I was where you are, but God has transformed me and he can do the same for you because we are they. Whose responsibility is it after pandemic to rebuild the nation to rebuild the economy to find new ways of doing sustainable health care education working in your office calming anxieties in your college your school your family your friends well it's not on those in government it's not on those leading over big business it's on the people of God who in their brokenness, God puts his hand on and he sends them out to restore and set free the world around them. We are Spartacus. We are they. So as we close and and we think about moving into our year of Jubilee, uh, in in our next coming weeks, we're going to start talking about the Holy Spirit because it's the Holy Spirit that does that deep work in us. I wonder now whether you need some time in a cave where life has broken you down and you need to go into a cave with God and ask him now to strengthen you, that you would go in broken, but you would come out with his strength. Or maybe you need to be in the church of Corinth. We've just had a bit too much sin going on. And God would come and say, let me restore you. Let me cleanse you. Let me wash you. Let me set you free and then send you out. Just as your shampoo says, lather, rinse, repeat. What God has done in you, go and repeat with the world around you. And then we will be the they that build up the ancient ruins, that raise up the former devastations, things that have been going on for generations and generations and generations, we are the ones where it changes. We repair the ruined cities and we make streets for people to live in again, bringing life and hope in Jesus' name. We are they. God bless you in the year of God's favour.